Okay. This is a masterpiece that was created by Sandra. She came uh, to visit us not too long ago, actually, to paint this. And I think it, it, it sums up everything that we're trying to do at the Float Clinic and Research Center. And she captured it so wonderfully. There is a ton of symbolism. And, and perhaps next year, she could actually give a talk to show all the little secrets she threw into this. But I want to take you through a little bit, because I think it talks a lot about what floating does, especially for mental health. So to begin with, you have a floating head, and it's kind of stuck in this forest or trapped in the trees. And that's kind of symbolizing the struggle that people go through when they suffer from any forms of mental illness. And ultimately, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get to this sort of peaceful state of mind, right? Uh, a state free of suffering, essentially. And in order to get there, you have to come through the body, into the brain, but unfortunately, there's clouds stuck in the way. And these clouds are kind of like all the thoughts, all the cognitions, all the things getting in the way of reaching that state. And ultimately, the person is looking out to the top of the mountain, and this is the journey. How do I get there? How do I get myself well? How do I live life in a meaningful way? And what you find here is you can't go through the land. Remember, you've got these clouds here. The only way to reach the top of the mountain is you have to come through the water. And I don't know if you could see this. The very bottom is a person at the top of the mountain holding the sun. And so this is the initial mural that every patient that's going to come through our clinic sees. And really, we can't have done this without Sandra. I mean, she, she put this together in a one-week period of time, having never done a mural of this magnitude before, and it turned out wonderfully. So thank you, Sandra. <laughs> but let's talk about this. What? What's going on in a float? So you, you, you come in, you have you know, this, this float session where your mind expands, but then afterwards there's a residue, and everyone here knows it. I mean, raise your hand here if you felt a post-float glow. See, this is great. I'm, I'm around my peers. I tell this to my research colleagues. They say, a glow? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> but everyone knows what it is when you feel it. And it's kind of strange, you know? You're sitting out there at lunch amongst all these Portlanders at Farmer's Market, right? And you go up to them and you say, hey, listen, I want you to go lay down in this quiet environment and in salt water for a while, and you're going to come out feeling great, and it might last for hours or days in some people. I mean, how many people would believe you? They'd think you're nuts. It's like, ah, oh, I lay down in water? I Maybe 10 minutes, I'd feel good, and then, you know, I'm back to my normal life. But this residue is important. It's important because it's doing something beneficial for your mental health. It's putting your brain into a state of equilibrium that it couldn't have achieved otherwise. And I want to study this. I want to understand what's happening in the brain that sort of signifies or correlates with this experience. And so what I'm going to talk about in this presentation really relates to this part of it. Now keep in mind, in our first brain imaging study, everyone's being scanned after the float is over. Now if someone in the audience could invent an MRI scanner that could go into a float pool, talk to me, because then we could study this part. <laughs> but for now, this is what we're studying. Now, another thing that we have to talk about is the cultural zeitgeist. And this is prominent. And in fact, when I was growing up, I don't think it was nearly as bad as it is right now. And the cultural zeitgeist is we need to have constant stimulation. If we don't have our phone with us 24-7, we start panicking. If we get pinged in the middle of the night with a little text where we wake up, we're stumbling for our phone, we're looking at the text, our brain is wired for all of this stimulation. And people, when you hear about you know, what happens in a float tank, generally their first response is like, ooh, 
I have to do what? By myself? And nothing's there? This sounds horrible. <laughs> well, a study came out last year in a very prominent scientific journal, and this is the abstract. Just think, the challenges of the disengaged mind. Timothy Wilson at University of Virginia was the lead author, and here's what it says. In 11 studies, we found that participants typically did not enjoy spending 6 to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but think, that they enjoyed doing mundane external activities much more, and that many preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves <laughs> instead of being left alone with their own thoughts. Most, seem, most people seem to prefer to be doing something rather than nothing, even if that something is negative. So, this year I had the opportunity to go to a conference called the Blue Mind Conference. And Dr. Jay Nichols, who's going to sort of uh, close out the conference tomorrow, um, organized this Blue Mind Conference. And he invited Tim Wilson there, and I was a presenter as well. And I got a chance to meet with Tim and talk to him about this. I said, what were you doing here? He goes, well, we basically had one of you know, our psychology offices, and an old psychology building, and the students would come in and they'd just, you know, sit in this chair, and that was it. It was like an uncomfortable chair and a table, and you just sit there for 15 minutes and you could shock yourself if you wanted. <laughs> I said, you know, hey Tim, did, did you ever consider, you know, try to replicate your experiment inside of a float tank? And he goes, ooh, never thought of that. Well, I think what we know as an industry is this experience of being alone with our thoughts is actually not that aversive. This experience of nothingness that floating provides is actually pleasurable. And I'm going to show you some data now to back that up. Here's from our first study. Remember, we have eight people in the float chair condition and eight people in the float pool condition. And here's the scale that we asked them after their float was over, okay? I'll take you through this. The question was very simple. Overall, how was your float experience? We didn't want to bias them, so it was a bipolar scale. It could range from extremely unpleasant all the way up to extremely pleasant with uh, uh, neutral being right in the middle. So if you didn't like the experience, if the 90 minutes of, of being by yourself was aversive, and remember, 90 minutes, that's six times longer than the experiment we were just talking about with Dr. Wilson. And what you find is, even in the chair condition, where they're not in this very nice warm pool of water, the majority of subjects are finding it pleasurable. This is data right away that says something, that there's something wrong with those findings we just saw. And you're going to hear people replicate, or not replicate, but speak about that previous study, because it was, it was published in a very prominent journal. And you need to come back at them and say, well, it doesn't replicate when you do floating or even a relaxed chair condition. What's interesting, though, is in the pool condition, the amount of pleasure is actually a lot more than the chair condition. Um, not a single person in either study uh, didn't report at least a little bit above the level of 50, which means everyone at some degree was finding it at least a little bit pleasurable. And I think that's an important point. Um, what you find typically in our, in our current cohort of subjects is about one person in each group did find it somewhat boring. So I think boredom is a possibility. But in terms of, you know, shocking yourself and saying, you know, this is horrible, nobody's talking about that when it comes to floating or even the chair condition. Now, what else uh, differs the, between these two groups? I think this is the big one. This is a, a measure of serenity that's done on a standardized scale called the Pontus X. And I want you to kind of learn the color code scheme here because we're going to use this throughout today's presentation, all right? So the pool group is always going to be in blue. The chair group's always in gray. And then we ask them to fill out these measures both before they float and after. The before is going to be in this sort of lighter hatch color, and then the after is in the dark shade, okay? So what you clearly see here is after you come out of the pool condition, 
your level of serenity almost comes up to the maximum. And this is a big effect size. It's about a 1.3 when you look at Cohen's D, and that's actually considered a very large effect. And this is a small group of subjects. So serenity is really an important part of the float experience. And what does serenity mean? Well, it, when you're answering this questionnaire, it's asking you things like how calm do you feel, how relaxed do you feel, how at ease do you feel. I think serenity is really the, the main uh, uh, aspect of positive affect that floating is tapping into. As an aside note, who here is a Seinfeld fan? <laughs> so you, you, you guys know the episode Serenity Now? <laughs> Every time I see this graph, I, I see Frank Costanza saying, Serenity Now! <laughs> so Serenity is really, I think, uh, one of the main variables that we're seeing move from pre to post float, and it's not moving nearly as much in the chair condition. Here's another question we asked afterwards. How relaxed do you feel right now from not at all to the most I've ever felt? We did have some floaters who, who actually ranked it all the way up to the top, but in general, the pool condition is showing a, a bigger jump in relaxation post-float than the chair. Uh, this gets a little bit more movement. How refreshed do you feel? And the pool, once again, is, is quite a bit more than the chair in terms of differences from pre to post-float. So when you look at you know, what is characterizing the float experience, at least in the sample that we're studying here, you're seeing changes in things like how pleasant was the experience, how much serenity do you currently feel, how refreshed do you feel, how relaxed do you feel. We also looked at the negative side of things, and what you find is, listen, this is a sample of healthy people. We screen them to be free of any sort of neurological or psychiatric illness. And as a consequence, at baseline, they're all at the floor when it comes to negative affect. Now, if I was studying a group of people with, say, severe anxiety, what you would expect at baseline is somewhere in this vicinity. And so, unfortunately, we can't actually measure any changes in negative affect or mood with this sample because they're pretty much at floor right away. We also looked at state anxiety, and once again, you see this floor effect. Uh, the pool condition does seem to show a little bit more of a decrement when it comes to post-float reductions in anxiety. And you could also ask a very simple question, how stressed or anxious do you feel right now? And once again, the pool condition goes down to basically all the way at the bottom. But once again, it's hard to really tap into anxiety because this is a healthy sample. They're coming into the float experience already stress-free. My prediction is if we start to, to look at this in people who have high levels of stress and anxiety at baseline, is you would see dramatic drops. So really what we're, we're dealing with is a tale of two effects. And I love this picture because it kind of captures it perfectly. You know, on the one hand, you have floating kind of zapping away all the stress in your life, right? And, and what I find, in fact, is when you bring a lot of stress into the float experience, the effect tends to be even bigger. I sometimes, like, will build up my stress just to, <laughs> you know, get into the float and then come out and you're like, oh, my God, why didn't I do that two days ago? So you clearly have this, this effect, but in this sample, these are healthy people, so they don't really have much stress to begin with. But what we did find in this sample is the other side of floating, the rainbow side, right? This is the glow. They are finding themselves to have a much higher level of serenity from pre to post float. And what's, what's accounting for that in the brain? So we want to begin to understand this in the brain. And in order to do that, we're using fMRI. And there's a task in fMRI known as the monetary incentive delay task. Now, you're in this sort of cramped scanner, and I grant you this is no float experience. It's noisy, um, it looks like a giant donut, and you're sitting there in there with you know, a little bit of a view to see something on a screen. So it's not necessarily conducive uh, to a post-float experience. It's not something I would, say, recommend to you after your float, go hop in an MRI scanner. <laughs> but we have a chair group, a control condition, so we could kind of try to account for some of those effects. But the monetary incentive delay task taps into sort of positive affect, it taps into reward, 
I'm going to take you through what that task actually entails. It always begins with a cue. And with fMRI, you have to have very sort of controlled and contrived paradigms in order to extract what's happening in the brain. So the cue is usually a simple circle or square. But what it actually tells you is you now have the opportunity to win five bucks. And we actually pay people this money at the end. And so by the end of this task, people could win as much as $50. And we'll, we'll, we'll give them that to them at the very end of the study. So they are incentivized. That's part of the, the task. But it's really a task of anticipation, right? So you see the queue, and then there's a delay. And after the delay, <coughs> You see a triangle, and this is really all you have to do in the task. As soon as you see the triangle, you press a button. And if you press the button quick enough, what will end up happening is you could actually win the reward. If you don't press the button quick enough, you won't win anything. And you could change these contingencies. So in some trials, you could win $5. In other trials, it could be, say, negative 5. So here, you press the button quick enough, you don't lose any money. But if you don't press the button quick enough, you lose $5. So this task has both reward and punishment. But the important part here is there's an anticipatory period where you have no idea if you're going to win the money or not. And that's what we're measuring in the brain. It's the anticipation of reward. And there's a specific area in the brain that seems to be acutely sensitive to this anticipation of reward. It's right here. It's a subcortical structure in the ventral striatum known as the nucleus accumbens, okay? And you guys are going to get used to that, that name soon because this is a very important structure, I think, when it comes to what floating is doing. And what we find in this task, and this was a study that was done many years ago. It's been replicated in thousands and thousands of people at this point. It's a very popular task to run, is the signal, whether you're have a chance of, say, losing $5, or not winning or losing any money whatsoever, or going all the way up to $1, across the board, it doesn't really do much in terms of activating this region. But when you get to this $5 reward condition, where you could really win some money, in anticipation of that win, this nucleus accumbens signal goes way up. OK? So what it's saying is that in anticipation of large rewards, you see this surge of activation in this brain region. And our prediction was that floating would further enhance this reward-related signal, OK? And this is the idea, uh, once again, behind this, what, what, what might be underlying some of the post-float glow. Now, keep in mind, no brain region by itself works in isolation. Everything in the brain is part of a larger system. It's intimately connected with many other structures, and it's all done in networks. And the network that the nucleus accumbens is connected to is something known as the mesolimbic pathway, all right? I'm going to take you through this. It's really not hard. Right here in the midbrain, just uh, above the, the main uh, uh, areas of the brainstem, you have a nucleus called the ventral tegmental area. This is the, uh, one of the nuclei that produces dopamine in our brain. And it's one of the main dopamine producers. And so the dopamine production happens here. And then it sends its connections all the way up into the nucleus accumbens, where it releases that dopamine. All right? And then from the nucleus accumbens, it has a whole slew of connections that infiltrate the prefrontal cortex, especially this area of the prefrontal cortex known as the orbitofrontal cortex, so right above your eyeballs. So it's a three-step pathway. Step one, you have the dopamine being produced in the ventral tegmental area. Step two, it gets released into areas of the ventral striatum, like the nucleus accumbens. And then step three, it communicates into the prefrontal cortex. Now, this pathway is extremely important. We've, we've, we've studied this extensively in both humans and non-human animals. And here's what we know. Firstly, it's very rich in dopamine, but not just dopamine. So for example, the nucleus accumbens has tons of uh, uh, opioid receptors, has GABA, has serotonin. But dopamine is clearly uh, one of the main players in this pathway. It's highly involved in reward 
and it's highly involved in motivating our behavior. Let me explain what I mean by that. This pathway tends to fire most in anticipation of reward. It was most elegantly demonstrated by a neuroscientist named Wolfram Schultz, who was putting electrodes into monkeys' brains right into this area of the ventral tegmental nuclei, okay? And what he would do is he would give the monkeys juice rewards. And as soon as he, he gave a, a little a snippet of juice to a monkey, the cells would just start firing, and you could hear them clicking away. And then what he started doing is he started pairing a light a few seconds before you would receive the juice reward, right? And what he saw was a complete reversal. Now the cells stopped firing when they received the juice, but started firing a few seconds beforehand when they saw the light. The light was predicting the onset of the reward, and now the cells went absolutely crazy. And you could tell this is part of what motivates our behavior. As humans, as any animal species, we're always trying to figure out how to get to the reward. Once we're there, it's like, oh, okay, what's next? And this is kind of the human condition, right? We're always striving, we're always struggling to get there. And then once we're there, it's like, all right, what's next? And it's because this pathway is constantly driving our behavior to that what next. It's anticipating reward. Now, what are the implications of that? Well, every single drug of abuse, as you could imagine, would engage this pathway directly. And it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's cocaine or heroin or marijuana or alcohol, it's going to hit different levels of this pathway. As does natural rewards like food or sex or compulsive behaviors like gambling. I mean, think about anticipating rewards. If you go to a casino, you're sitting there looking at people pulling this stupid slot machine, and you're like, my gosh, there's really no difference between our species and rats because they're just pressing levers. But really what's happening, <laughs> they're stimulating this pathway, the same pathway that the rat has. And it's driving the behavior, and it keeps the behavior going even if they don't win a reward because what this pathway is doing is anticipating the reward. And then finally, there's been a lot of recent work, including work done by Dr. Kyle Simmons, who just presented, showing that this pathway contains what might be called pleasure centers or hedonic hotspots, where when you activate these regions, like the nucleus accumbens, or an area called the ventral pallidum, you actually enhance the experience of pleasure, and that pleasure could be related to, say, things like eating a nice piece of chocolate cake, or having sex, or just engaging in social conversation. And so uh, uh, what you find in these pleasure centers or hedonic hotspots especially is um, they infuse sort of your external experience with this internal feeling of well-being. So I think this pathway is very, very important, and my presumption was it was going to come into play at floating at some level. So I'm going to show you some data now uh, from the monetary incentive delay task in floaters, and let's see what happens in this pathway, okay? First step is you have the ventral tegmental area, and that's stage one of this pathway. So what happens in a floater's brain in this small area, this small nucleus that creates dopamine and sends it outwards into the nucleus accumbens? So here it is. Right here, you have a cluster of, of different voxels that nicely sort of corresponds to where you would expect the ventral tegmental area to be, and it's showing a high level of activation. Now, I just want to give you a sense of what that means. So, the way we do our imaging experiments is our voxel size is about two millimeters. So, each one of these little voxels is about two millimeters cubed. And if you went in there with a microscope and started counting how many different cells are in that one two millimeter voxel, we're talking about 100,000 neurons in that little space. So this is a cluster of cells of many different neurons that is activating during the monetary incentive delay task in anticipation of winning the $5 reward, okay? And now here's what happens in the different conditions. So once again, remember the color scheme. In blue is the post-float 
fMRI scan, okay? In gray is the post-float chair fMRI scan. So remember, blue is the pool group, gray is the chair group, and then immediately to the left of it is the pre-float. Remember, everyone gets scanned before they've ever floated before, so that's kind of the baseline. And what you're seeing is in the pool condition, a surge in activation post-float in the ventral tegmental area. Whereas in the chair condition, it's the exact opposite. It tends to go down. And the reason I displayed this graph as such is because this is preliminary data. We need to analyze this with a larger cohort of subjects to know that it replicates. But these are big effects. I'm not, I'm not lying when I say that. And essentially, this is one voxel that's centered at these crosshairs. And then all of these squares are the voxels around that voxel, OK? And what you're seeing is that across that whole area of space, the same sort of pattern, where post-float, you're seeing this surge of activation, whereas post-chair, it tends to actually come down. So I think this is saying something about what's happening. And we can't say anything about whether it's dopamine, but given the fact that this is the ventral tegmental area, my presumption is it's probably related to dopamine release. Now, next step of the pathway, nucleus accumbens, right? Take a guess what happens post-float in the nucleus accumbens. Just goes crazy. And it's, it's, you know, it's not just the nucleus accumbens. The entire area of the ventral striatum and all the regions around it seems to also have this enhanced level of activation. So here's how it breaks down when you compare it to the chair group. So once again, at baseline, you're not seeing too much activation, but post-float, it tends to go way up. And in the chair group, you really don't see much difference between baseline and then post-chair. Uh, so once again, you're seeing a large rise in anticipation of reward in this mesolimbic pathway, and in specifically the nucleus accumbens. I was really excited when I saw this, guys. And I saw this for the first time about three days ago. So I'm still excited. <laughs> but it's the sort of thing that um, I was always looking at this chair group to see, you know, is this specific? You know, maybe they're just relaxed. As I showed you earlier, the chair group found this to be somewhat pleasurable, right? but yet their brain is responding in a very different way than the pool group. And I think this is very specific to floating. Now, the final connection of the mesolimbic pathway goes into the prefrontal cortex. So the question then, what happens there? Well, there's a specific area that it tends to project to, known as the medial orbital frontal cortex. So kind of go right into the middle where your eyeballs are, go back just a little bit, and this is the area right here. And so what's happening now post-float in this region? It's shutting off. So in the baseline condition, you see actually quite a bit of activation, but post-float, it essentially shuts off. And in the chair group, you really don't see that same sort of decrement at all. So this is curious. I, I, I'm still processing it, trying to understand what it all means. But we know that this region is involved in sort of regulating our behavior, right? So for example, if you have a surge of dopamine, the, 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 the typical thing is to engage in some sort of compulsive behavior. And you would imagine that this region is trying to regulate what that behavior is. The fact that this is shutting off post-float is interesting. What does that mean? I was speaking to Jim Hefner about this yesterday, and he was saying one of the things he finds that when he comes out of a float, he doesn't need to do anything. It's this sort of state of sort of very quiet contentedness where you don't need to engage in any sort of compulsive behaviors. You could just be. And perhaps this is signifying something related to that. We just don't know yet. But very interesting, and not necessarily something I would have predicted. So preliminary conclusions from this. 
Floating appears to modulate activation in the mesolimbic pathway during anticipation of reward, and specifically, it enhances the reward processing in subcortical structures, like the nucleus accumbens, but it reduces the processing in prefrontal regulatory regions like the medial orbital frontal cortex. And we'll have to see if that replicates in the larger sample. I think this is going to be really interesting. Could we take those changes in, say, serenity and correlate them to the changes in activation in this pathway? And if so, this might be a biomarker that could kind of predict someone's post-float glow. So that's something we're planning on doing um, as we collect more data with this. And I think this has some important clinical implications for drug addiction specifically, and it might provide a plausible mechanism for how floating may help addicts overcome withdrawal symptoms. You know, think about this. We know that what creates craving, what creates your urge to go after a drug, is this pathway. It's, it, it's intimately connected to that. And as you're going through withdrawal, we know that regions like the nucleus accumbens are totally misfiring. So it's no surprise to me that you hear stories like John Lennon stepping into a float tank back in the 70s to overcome his heroin addiction. Well, perhaps what's happening is it's providing a natural enhancement of this pathway, a natural surge in activation in, say, regions like the nucleus accumbens that gets rid of the withdrawal symptoms that you normally have to experience, say, when you're trying to come off of heroin. And so I think this is really fascinating because it does provide some mechanism by which this may be helping drug addiction. But I also think it provides some uh, 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 mechanism for how it might help people with depression overcome anhedonia. We know people who are anhedonic, which means things that normally would bring you pleasure no longer do. We know that people who are experiencing anhedonia have dysregulation in the nu nucleus accumbens, I have a colleague of mine in Germany who's actually starting to do deep brain stimulation where he implants electrodes into the nucleus accumbens of people with chronic depression and starts stimulating them to try to get them out of it. And the big change you see is they become less anhedonic. So I think this is also maybe a natural way and much less invasive than putting an electrode in the brain to do this. So this is very exciting to me. Um, I think it has a ton of potential, but we, once again, need to replicate it. So before I wrap up, I want to kind of give you guys a preview of what's on the horizon. We're doing this fMRI study. We're going to wrap up this first study this fall, but we have a ton of other studies in the works, and there are, some of them are, are a little further down the line. Some of them are happening more immediately. First thing is we still need to analyze the resting state fMRI data set. Some of you may already know this in the crowd, but our brain is percolating all the time, every moment of the day. And we didn't know this really until about 20 years ago when we started doing functional neuroimaging experiments, and we kept finding the same set of brain regions that would pop up online when people were doing absolutely nothing. And they called this the resting state network, or the default mode. And so we did this, this same sort of brain scan where you have people do absolutely nothing, and you just look at what's happening in the brain during that state. And we need to analyze that data. I think that's going to hold a lot of interesting clues to what's happening post-float. There are many fMRI projects still to come. And I want to make an announcement. I'm looking for a postdoctoral research scholar to help me with the analysis of the fMRI data. So talk to your friends. If you know anybody who is a postdoc that's computationally savvy, Please, send them my way, and we're going to do some really interesting research. I'm also, uh, I've started already collecting EEG data during the float, and we could finally see if we could replicate Tom Fine's seminal finding where theta state goes up selectively during the float. Um, hopefully next uh, year at the conference we'll be able to speak to this question. This is exciting. Um, where's Shoshana Liebner? There she is. Shoshana created a, a very unique connection with the Epsom Salt Council. And the Epsom Salt Council is like kind of, I, I, I don't know how to best describe them, but they represent all of the Epsom Salt industry. And they're very interested to know what happens to the, all the magnesium that's sort of floating in that pool of water that you're in and whether or not it's actually getting into your body. Now, 
I just, I'm actually curious. How many people here think magnesium is getting into your body during the float? Okay, well, there's never been a single study to document this. <laughs> and this is what's so amazing. You, you know, you, you look at years and years of Epsom salt research, but they've never validated whether it's actually getting in and a, being absorbed into the body. So we've, we've reached an agreement where we're going to do a very thorough project and take blood and urine samples pre and post float and have people float longitudinally for almost a dozen times and track whether the magnesium levels in blood and urine is going up with the float exposure. And this could be the first study to document whether magnesium really is crossing that skin barrier. So I'm super excited about this study and Shoshana was, was critical in setting this up. Um, Rich Martin's about to speak here. I think as an industry, we need to do more bench testing of the efficacy of Epsom salt and just infectant by itself. And there's some really interesting studies that we could do just to see how well uh, Epsom salt is able to eradicate various forms of bacteria and viruses. And I think Graham has put together a website where people could donate to this cause and allow us to do the sort of test that we need to hand over to health regulators and say, listen, Epsom salts by itself are doing a lot. And then eventually we could start seeing how other forms of disinfection add to that. We're finally starting to do research with clinical populations. Both uh, my colleagues, Dr. Kalsa and Dr. Simmons mentioned this, but if we're going to get floating on the map in Western medicine, we have to perform randomized controlled trials. And I think the first one that I want to do, and we're already starting to plan for, is targeting PTSD. I think the effect of floating on a brain that has been traumatized is profound. And I don't know how many people here know somebody who's endured trauma, either earlier in life or more recently, but I'd be very curious to hear anecdotal stories of how floating has helped them overcome their PTSD symptoms. And the hope is probably next year we'll begin sort of pilot testing the protocol and then maybe two years from now start the RCT. But if we could do a proper RCT, not just in dozens of people, but in hundreds of people, I think we're going to find some giant effects for how floating could help PTSD. And we've also started another study with eating disorders. And Emily Noren is going to be giving a talk later talking about the effects that floating could have on somebody who, say, suffers from anorexia. And attached to LIBOR on the top floor is a whole unit of inpatient, uh, uh, essentially women, who are suffering from various eating disorders. And we've already started meeting with them on a weekly basis. Um, we've had all the clinicians there floating so they could see what it's like. And the hope is, Starting later this year, we're going to have our first set of women with uh, various forms of eating disorder trying out floating and seeing how it affects their body image. So often what happens when, when you're suffering from an eating disorder is your, your feeling of your own body is one of complete negativity. You hate yourself. And I've heard many anecdotal stories where people come out of a float and for the first time there's this sort of feeling of self-acceptance. And I see this in males, I see this in females, I don't think it distinguishes. But that would be very interesting if we could actually show systematically that women who go in with disturbed body images could come out with a more accepting, loving opinion of who they are and what their body is like. And then finally, we're starting some research collaborations with other float centers. We only have two float pools. We're going to be doing a lot of physiological studies, we're going to be doing some clinical studies, but if we want to do large ends, we need more float pools. And there's places out there that have them. One of which is about to open next week. This is uh, uh, one of the pools that Jim Hefner created in Pasadena. And the name of his company is Just Float. And in about two weeks, it's going to open, and it will be the world's largest float center. It will have 11 float tanks. And what Jim has done is tremendous. He's, he's paid attention to every single detail, whether it be sound or air quality or water temperature or humidity levels, and he's integrated it into all of his tanks, so you could assure there's going to be a level of consistency that's unprecedented. 
And so the hope is we're going to be able to do much larger scale studies in hundreds of people as we begin these collaborations with other float centers. So uh, in, in closing, you know, man, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you uh, if, if we find even a glimmer of positive effects in any, any of these endeavors, I think we could make, really make a, a point in the field of medicine that this is a safe and natural way to go about creating these changes. You don't need drugs. You don't need deep brain stimulation. You don't need to even uh, have to do anything invasive except just sit there and lay in a pool of water. And that's what's so amazing about all of this, that you could have a post-float glow and it required absolutely nothing. So thank you guys. And this is the laboratory that is the first iteration of the Float Clinic and Research Center, and they've done a great job in uh, uh, allowing us to come here this week and present all the data, which really was collected in over about a month. So next year, we're gonna have a lot more data, and I can't wait to present it for all of you. So thank you.